Good day, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Renette Leibovitz, and we are thrilled to have you with us. We wish we could be in the same room, but then again, luckily with, you know, technology, it allows us to connect with you wherever you are in the comfort of your home or your office, wherever you are. So thank you for spending time with us. I am absolutely thrilled about this specific conversation and the opportunity to be joined by the panelists to share with you some more like behind the scenes facts that we might not find anywhere else. So first of all, I would like to thank our research partner, Yellowwood, and our headline partner, Gautrain, for partnering with the Sunday Times Gen Next Digitized series. And also, if I may give a shout out to Tanya and the team behind the scenes who've set this up and who've invited us as panelists. I would like to also remind you to use the hashtag ST Gen Next when you are busy on socials and please let's get the conversation going there share what you learn let's create a ripple effect as industry players and role players who can actually take what we learn here and share it with the rest of our colleagues so sunday times gen next now in its 17th year is the leading annual brand um, preference and consumer behavior research on the youth and I think it gives us great insight as to what we are need, what we need to focus on as marketers and communicators. So I think it's also important for me to share why I personally care about this so much. Like I said, my name is Rianette Leibovitz, and since 2014, I've been on a mission to save lives by creating awareness for responsible digital engagement. And my journey started when I heard of the shocking statistics of young people who commit suicide because of cyberbullying. Of course, there's lots of other issues around it and we'll be discussing those. But since my start of my journey, starting to speak about cyber safety, it's actually changed into cyber wellness because what we are talking about today is really so intricate but also we can no longer just say we've got our physical lives versus our digital lives everything has become so intertwined and as an author and a speaker and founder of safety net cyber safety i've been on the other side of this spectrum where i help cybercrime victims the ones who are impacted negatively by what happens on social media networks and the internet. Now, let me just say, I love the internet and social media and what it offers. And we've got the opportunity today to see and experience it for ourselves. But from um, helping young people and public figures to deal with the issues that we're talking about today, I can really say that every one of us can play an active role. I am a mom of an almost 13 year old. So I am in the state where I have a son who is using Twitter and Instagram and all the other platforms. And as an expert, it doesn't mean that as a mom, I've got all the answers. We still are faced with the same challenges. And um, I think that for me, I can see how brands are influencing not only my son, but also his friends. And um, I think it's important for us to all just take a moment today and wear both hats as parents or grandparents, maybe we are uncles and aunts, whatever it is, we're not just representing our companies today or as professionals, we are here as people who have influence on young people as well. So in terms of our topic, I don't think I need to share with you too much about the statistics and the the situation that we're currently finding ourselves in. But what we do know is that we have amazing, not only opportunities, but with technology, it's there's so many new advantages that our previous generations didn't have. Everything from greater access to effective healthcare, healthcare accessible education, as well as broader transport and trade networks. But it's a double-edged sword and I think you'll agree that today we are talking about not just the positives but also the scary parts of social media. So with screen time at an all-time high um, and fascinating things going on online, I it's important for us to look at the threats and how do we actually play a role. So with me I have an incredible panel to take us through some of their insights and experiences and um, yeah for us to say 
how are we ensuring that we are not just selling products, but we are actually using our platforms to create a new narrative, to take a hashtag moment and change it into a hashtag movement for a purpose. So first of all, I'm gonna invite Paul Esterhazen, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Internet SA, to join me. And um, I'm gonna ask Paul to introduce himself. And Paul, I'm gonna ask you, what is the top cyber, cyber threat facing the youth today? Over to you. Thank you, Rianette. And yes, glad to be on board here this morning. And an hour is never going to be enough. Um, mm -hmm. I know who else is on this panel, and I know that we could all regale and talk and speak for more than enough time. Uh, the background alone could probably take more than an hour. So I'm gonna dive straight in and say that I can share some of the things that are on my heart. Back in 1967, and I can speak authoritatively about that, a man called Edward de Bono emerged and he said to the world, there is a thing called lateral thinking. And lateral thinking means you take something that's apparently complex, you shift all the gears in your mind, and you actually come up with something that is so brilliantly simple, but so effective. So over and again, in all of our lives, people have said to us, just think laterally, just think laterally. It's never gone away. And in actual fact, I don't think he invented it. I think he labeled it. It's what we do. So what is the biggest cyber threat that we all face? Because we can name them. We can say it's cyberbullying, it's predators, it's phishing, it's malware, it's posting private information. It's about me creating a footprint. It's about my opinions. It's about my identity. And I'm going to say it's actually there is no single cyber threat that can be labeled as the biggest cyber threat that's facing the youth of today. The youth of today are far more tech savvy than what their generation that preceded them have ever been. And in actual fact, the biggest cyber threat I believe we face is currently being developed by others whom we haven't seen because we will find new labels, we will find new ways of, of addressing those issues. And the biggest single threat that we have is in actual fact the self-esteem that we carry with ourselves. The youth carry self-esteem that has either been broken, developed, and the biggest threat they have is how they clutch onto any one of these weaknesses, any one of these strengths. And if they don't use what's available for its purpose, then their self-esteem becomes the biggest cyber threat that they will have to live with. I hope that frames it in a nutshell. Thank you, Paul. And I'm so thankful that you actually mentioned something that's got nothing to do with technology. It's got to do with the way we see ourselves and how we actually are being impacted by our peers and our parents and our environments. Um, so I'm going to ask Micah Hybrids to introduce herself as well. But Micah is the Chief of Child Protection, Protection at UNICEF. And Micah, I would like to then lead on to what Paul just said and ask you to, could you please walk us through a recent real life um, cyber threat scenario and how the youth are affected by you, by this? Well, thank you so much, Raina, to having me this morning. I agree with Paul, but I don't need more than an hour. My name is um, Micah Hebrecht and I've been doing this work for UNICEF for 23 years in different companies. And it's a pleasure to share some of the, the learnings this morning. I'm also a mother of a 17 year old who is daily on Instagram and on all these snapshot things. So I do need to carefully watch her. So we have recently seen uh, this case of a girl in Limpopo who was bullied by a peer uh, on the school compound. And then that level of violence and harassment spilled over to online harassment with WhatsApp and Instagram. And after this girl was the victim, then blocked her from Instagram that led then to violence on the school compound where the perpetrator beat her up. And after which she took her life um, that same evening. So um, another case was of you know, girls in Australia, she was gaming online and she befriended a man online and thought he was living far away. She didn't know him and felt very comfortable, felt more and more comfortable, became in a relationship with this man online, started to share sexual and sensual inter intimate uh, images. But as a result, all of a sudden, this man became a boy from her classroom. And... Um, when she found that out, she never dared to go back to school and dropped out of school and became completely isolated. 
So the impact of sexting, harassment, bullying online uh, does demonstrate isolation, high levels of anxiety, distress, um, not engaging anymore with friends and peers, life, but really online, and, and indeed can lead to committing suicide, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Micah. And yeah, those, those two examples, um, especially um, the girl from Limpopo, you know, it's, it's still so fresh and still hurts to even think about it. And it should never have happened. Um, from my point of view, I just wish, um, you know, young people especially would know that there, there's help available and that there's resources available. But you've touched on the fact that they feel isolated and the fact that they feel lonely even though they are surrounded by all their online friends and um it's the it's it's a challenge for us as parents as well because they need to have an, an online identity while teaching them to have real real life friends so um thank you very much for sharing those examples with us and i'm going to hand over to Svelele Mujaru, um senior public relations manager at unilever and um excited to hear about, more about the Dove campaign. So I just want to mention in terms of this Dove campaign, the hashtag no digital distortion, um, the let's change beauty, and the pledge that people can do online is just so remarkable and so inspiring. So thank you to Dove and everyone involved in the background. We know that there's a creative team, there's marketing team, the communicators, and um, it's, it's really awesome to see the reserve, reverse selfie hashtag movement that's happened. So, um, Sibilele, can you please introduce yourself a little bit more? And I want to kick off with a question to ask you as a communication professional um, and as professionals on this webinar, we can no longer depend on the strategies of 10 years ago. So how do you go about your PR and communications plans um, to address the youth? Um, hi, everyone that's online. Um, it really is exciting to um, do a webinar with um, all these experts um, to talk about something so relevant and so important for us to have a conversation about. Um, and my name is Pele Um I'm from um, KZN. I work at Unilever. I'm the PR and um, influencer marketing lead for um, Unilever South Africa. Um, I think your question is so important um, because it, it, it makes us responsible marketeers. So at Unilever, um, we've been on a journey for, I'd say, since 2017 to actually really um, stand for something um, and not to only talk about our brands only, but to understand what are the cultural um, trends that are happening, um, what's the research telling us so that we can begin to build trust um, with our young audience or with our audience. Um, and at the moment, as we stand in 2021, on the 9th of March, we launched our new uh, vision, which is about being more positive um, in the way that we communicate. So we launched our positive beauty campaign um, or our vision and commitments, which is about really representing um, or building our brand communication plans that align to making sure that we really smash um, the narrow ideals of beauty and to really represent people as they are in our society. What that means is that we understand what are the stereotypes that are available from a beauty perspective. We also look at trends such as Black Lives Matter um, and LGBTQI um, and ensure that in the way that we communicate to our youth, we make sure that we align to the trends and also we smash the stereotypes that are available, um, which are really narrow, um, that represent beauty. Um, so basically that's what we do. We build our strategies around um, positive beauty and ensuring that our campaigns are inclusive and diverse. And we also make sure that we are aligned to the trends that are currently happening in our, in our society to ensure that we don't only speak about our brands, but we become more relevant to the young people. That's incredible. Thank you so much. And I think the fact that you mentioned being not just online um, in terms of or in line with the trends and understanding what our markets are worried about, what keeps them awake at night. But what I'm seeing you do is you are setting the trends. You are actually taking something that 
is a pain point and changing the narrative about it. Um, I mean, the whole focus on self-esteem, confidence and well-being. And I mean, I never actually realized that on the Dove website, there are so many additional resources available that for families and, you know, everybody who can go and play games and just to take what you said, looking at these hashtag movements and use that to change the narrative as a brand and not just selling a product, but actually selling a lifestyle and a better one for that matter. So um, I've already received a question, which I'll, I'll pose in a moment. But Paul, if I can ask you, um, what if you, would you say advertising to children on digital platforms can be harmful? And if so, why? Well, it absolutely can be harmful because we've got to first understand that we're talking to an audience that has some digital literacy capabilities. We're talking to an audience that is busy shaping an identity, shaping a persona in what they're doing. And it's so great to hear Spilelli saying that the ethos behind what they're doing is deeper seated and it's got far more life relevance. And when the world, and we're now talking about not what happened in this past year, we're talking about what's happened in the last 15 months because we now have a point of reference from when everything got paused and then we repositioned where we are in the world. And it's allowed and enabled so many people to come in and say, we're going to target our audiences. But the, the cautious overlap here is that if a brand, if a marketeer came in and said, I want to create the ability to do the behavioral targeting of young people, because if I can shape and influence them and allow the idealism of what we're taking in our business, in our product, in our world, and impart it into those people's minds, into the youth's minds, it is the most dangerous place that we could ever go and take our business, our product, and mm -hmm. our alignment. So it was wonderful to see Ad Focus. I think they used the, the, one of the headlines in the recent Financial Mail, mm -hmm. and they spoke about saying the simple joys of life. Because in actual fact, there's a, there's a hunger that's within everybody that's now emerged as we've had to sit back and stop and take stock. So unless brands and unless marketeers really realize how deeply they're impacting a very, very literate audience and yet a very easily influenced audience because they are young, they are not mature, they haven't had the hard knocks of life yet. So yes, we can do enormous damage but we can also do such enormous good by giving them the ability to use all their emotional, their social, their intellectual abilities to enhance themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's risky. Thank you for that, Paul. And you've touched on a number of issues, which leads perfectly into the next questions, question for Micah as well. And that is, how do factors such as age social environment and own self-esteem play into being either a victim or a perpetrator. And Micah, from, you know, if I look at your profile, you've worked in so many different countries from Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and the Republic of Macedonia, et cetera. So I think from a, from a more global point of view, what would you say to this answer, to this question? Yeah, so Paul and me, we seem to see the same thing. Um, and I'm happy that we build on each other. So the vulnerabilities pertaining to children also have um, bearings on online risk. So if children who are child-headed households, children with disabilities, migrant children, youth-headed households, those are um, seen as children at risk and they are also at risk in the in the online space. Um, then in terms of the, um, the age is that the younger the child is, the less they are perceptive of the risk that they are facing and they are more easily manipulated to the issue of grooming and, and, and so on. So what happens is that the manipulation and grooming of younger children often takes time much longer and then therefore the after effects of these children being affected by grooming harassment online are much longer and much more intense. With older children, 15 to 17, they are much more internet savvy and they are able to, easy, they are also longer online and they are taking more opportunities 
but there the exposure to risk is more direct. For example, send me a picture of your books or whatever else. You know, it is more direct and more direct response. So what is always very important is that um, is, is that there is a mentor in a child's life who engages with that child on his or her online work. And children in advanced communities with less access to, um, you know, to internet access, but also maybe, you know, a an, an support network, there is need to really engage with this child to help him or her be protected online and to decrease the level. Of, uh, of exposure, but younger children need to be definitely guided uh, throughout their online work because they are the ones who are manipulated more. In terms of perpetrators, it is the same thing of seeking attention. Also, these children often are coming from a background of need for validation, recognition, to be loved, to get uh, attention and acknowledgement, etc. So also children who are perpetrating this level of bullying and harassment are in need of care and attention. And to add to that, Maka, I think what I've also noticed is the motivation for young people when they connect with people online or in digital spaces can be different depending on the area that they're from. So something that I've noticed, for instance, was um, in more rural areas, young girls don't mind it if someone takes photos of their naked breasts in order to get access to airtime. So for them, it's not a matter of worrying about my online or digital footprint or, you know, not being chosen or accepted at a university because of what I've done online for them. That's not even, a, they're not worried about that. Whereas um, children in, you know, private schools and so forth, also take naked selfies and are busy with sexting and so forth, but disregarding, you know, the fact that it will have an impact on their digital footprint, but to them at this stage, it's okay and it's consensual. So I think from my point of view as well, the, the environment and again, the level of self-esteem plays such an important role in this conversation. And we've got a question here from Patela um, saying, in the same manner, while we are concerned about external threats, what is the safety level of young children at home when some have been exposed to emotional, physical, and sexual abuse? And this is at home. There is usually focus on young girls, but are we also paying attention to young boys? And if young children cannot be protected at home, what chance do they have against external threats? So, Michael, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about what your thoughts are? Yes, thank you very much. So this is a very important question, and it's always um, good to look at your child protection network. So, first of all, it's to talk to somebody in the family when a child perceives a threat. But if the violence occurs in the family, then to look at peers that you trust or at an adult mentor that you trust, um, immediate uh, person uh, to, to then look for to is the caregiver in the ECD center or the teacher. But if there is a level of risk and violation involved, then you can call Childline, and I'll put the number on the chat in a minute, as well as, you know, uh, the referral must happen to more counselors from Childline or social workers, et cetera, depending on the risk and level of threat that the child is facing. But the immediate environment to find a mentor that one can trust and speak to, even a friend, is very important as a whistleblower to seek protection at all times. Thank you for that. And I think it's a good reminder. We probably know these you know, um, networks exist, but sometimes we forget. And as brands with platforms, with influence, um, I want to say that you've got the opportunity to remind young people about it, that there are networks available and you should never feel alone when you are devastated and in trouble. Um, so Spilele, can I ask you, Besides safety challenges that are poised um, by cyber threats, societal issues around beauty standards have a huge impact on young audiences. What should brands take into account when marketing image-related products to young audiences? 
I think um, the first point to start is that um, as brands, we have a responsibility to help young people to realize their full potential. You know, we understand that it's important for um, young people to reach their goals. And I think self-esteem has an integral role to play when it comes to when it comes to young people reaching their full potential. Um, and I think as as grown-ups, <laughs> we also understand that we've gone through this journey of unlearning and relearning to actually help our self-esteem because we saw that um, self-esteem is an important part for us to be confident about who we are so that we can be able to tackle everyday work, right? Um, so I think it's important for brands to, to help young people to realize their full potential in, in a way that they ensure that they raise young people's self-esteem and body confidence because we know that those two actually help them to realize their full potential. And we've seen, like, um, I think, as you said earlier on, um, we've had increased um, time, um, screen time during this pandemic. Um, and we know that even that is a threat to young people because a lot of imagery that is showcased on social media is really narrow. Um, you don't really see the full view of how people are really are in, in society. And with the recent research um, that has um, supported the reverse um, selfie campaign, is that we saw that um, about 83% of young people actually use filters um, as well as um, Photoshop kind of like apps on social media. Um, and that is 3% um, higher than any other country around the world, which is really alarming. Um, and I think that that's a big threat. And that's, that's why it's important for brands to ensure that um, they're being more responsible, they're more inclusive and diverse, because we also know that over 80% of young people say that um, they focus more about who they are rather than how they look like if brands actually portray that, that narrative. So I think it's important for us as brands and as brand custodians, and brands are people, right? <laughs> there are people that work behind those brands, but it's important for us to make sure that um, we are responsible, um, we align and, and we'll align our brand campaigns or brand communication campaigns um, that are for people, um, that help people realize their full potential, that help to raise their self-esteem as well as their body confidence. Thank you for that. And I think I, I want to mention just in terms of the responsibility that we have behind the scenes, I recently watched um, a show where it was about makeup, the makeup industry and just all the fake products out there, the counterfeit goods and how specifically they have a case study of a young girl who really desperately wanted this specific lip gloss. And unfortunately she bought the fake version with horrible products or horrible ingredients and she really had a difficult time um you know her lips got so badly damaged that she had a lot of trouble but she, it was because she wanted that specific brand and i think this is where things like um scarcity scarcity tactics and influencers and fake reviews really need to be taken into account and managed carefully. And as brands for us to be vigilant and almost, I want to say, um, take it to task and, you know, say, listen, besides the fact that it's wrong and that it's impacting our business, we are actually then getting into the hands of young people who believed a different story. So thank you very much for, for that. And um, I'm going to come back to Paul for a moment and ask, how is Poppy protecting the privacy of younger audiences? What should we keep in mind, Paul? Rihanna, we have to sit back and marvel at the fact that the Poppy Act has taken nearly a decade and is only being promulgated now. And then companies will still have a year to bring themselves in line to comply. But really, if you go, I think it's section 35 of the Poppy Act, which actually talks to the, the information of children and how you've got to deal with it and what their rights are. And we can legislate as much as we like. It's policing what's been legislated that has always been the dilemma because politically, all of this is challenged. And in a world of so much, I have a right and my rights need to be protected and I have a right to do whatever I want to do, be it on a TikTok platform or be it in my own personal blog that I create and tell the world what I think. And we know that so much of this is so readily influenced and it just dominates the world. So the Poppy Act is going to be great because we can finally bring it 
to the fore. It can be out there. and Everyone can say, what do we have to do? What's allowable? Brands can say, right, if that's allowable in our own brand, what's acceptable? What do we want to do? Because if we're going to do anything that violates any of the integrity of, and it's not only about the youth, and I'm going to touch on that now as well, because it's about parents and families. And if we've got families who do not have parents who are bringing up the youth, we've got a disconnect, but we've got a responsibility. But back to that Poppy Act, it is great that we're finally going to have it published and we can say that's what we have to adhere to. The reality for me is that you've got to comply with international public law. And that has got to be probably the basis of everything that we ever do, because as a corporate, you need to be aware of the fact that you need to ensure that you've got good governance about what you're doing. And you are going to get it wrong. And you're going to put something out there which suddenly lands up so innocently portraying something which everyone latches onto and they decry it. So in the brand world, and I just think of the Barilla advert, which was done on the rooftop tennis during the lockdown period when Roger Federer played tennis and got, I don't know how many million views. And every brand dreams of wanting to say, can we be there? Because we won't forget it and we will find that. And if we can find those threads of reality and put that into the youth, then we can comply with the protection of personal information. We can comply with how we can utilize what you allow us to do. And if you are under 18, the act will say that you can't take and collect information from those people unless you've got permission from an adult. It's never going to be practicable to be able to do that. It's not. You're going to find kids who are going in there and they're going to give you their information. And then you've got your own brand responsibility to say, if we do this with integrity, we will not be breaching the law and we won't be doing the wrong things. And yeah, I'm carry on forever. So let me give it back to you, Rianette. <laughs> and we can talk about parenting and, and, and the role we have to play to support brands. Um, I think that's also got to be one of the things that brands and businesses have to aspire to, to say, what is my product? How relevant is it in your family? Is it doing good? Is it doing bad? And, and how do we do that? And, and really, your biggest ally is not just the youth of, and, and the adults of tomorrow. It's the entire family and the entire community. That's true. And um, I think when we look at the law and the, these regulations, I mean, ultimately, they are there because we need them. And I recently attended um, a session about the Act and how it's going to impact us. And from a marketing point of view, I mean, we are aware that it's not just going to be opt out, but you'll have to opt in. And I think this is something to consider from a marketing point of view, because the, the younger generation will be our young or adults in the near future. And how are we preparing our marketing strategies and so forth to move with them and to actually guide them along and to respect their privacy? I mean, in terms of privacy and so forth, it's for me, besides the fact that there's the online dangers when in terms of what we share online, I do think that we as brands have a great um, space here where we can look at the social media platforms that we use and their rules and not just their terms and conditions, but also their community rules. And I would like to encourage everybody to go and have a read again. If you've never done it, maybe it's something new that you can explore. But each platform, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, has community rules. And those actually are perfect guidelines for us to also get us in line with Poppy and all the other acts that we need to. And like you said, Paul, international regulations that we need to keep in mind. Corporate governance, huge issue, because from a crisis communication point of view, if we don't adhere to this, if we don't take it to heart, we might um, have to have a crisis communi plan, communication plan ready. So, Micah, if I can, um, or wait, I'm going to come back to you, Micah, but Spilele, um, I would like to ask you, should brands consider whether some groups of children and adolescents are more vulnerable to social media perception? Um, to a large degree, most definitely, yes. Um, children and adolescents, um, um, ha we have a role. They, they compare themselves all the time. Um, they compare themselves to their friends. 
family and influencers. So it's very important for us as brands to make sure that the brand work that we put out there has really a good thought around what is it that we are putting out there because we know that um, young people um, will have a um, view of this. Also um, important, I think you mentioned it um, 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 earlier on, it's around yeah. even the people that we use as brands that represent our brand who are an extension of who we are as brands. Um, it's important to work with people that are not, not going to cause um, um, anxiety for, for young people. So it's important for us to really ensure that um, in, in how we put out the work, we know that young people will compare themselves. Um, and to what Paul was saying now about brands um, and the products that we use, um, I think over 1 billion people use Unilever products and they are in everybody's home. Um, and it's important for us that um, we ensure that the brand work that is put out there is for good. It's not just to make people feel beautiful or be beautiful, but it's, it's for people to really feel good from the inside. Um, and, and, and that's why it's important for us to really be cognizant of, of what we put there, put out there as brands, um, because um, young people compare themselves each and every day, each and every minute and second. Um, so it's important for us to support them and to make them feel good about themselves. And I want to ask you to, for us to delve a little bit deeper into this now, because we all have sat around that boardroom table or done our presentations where we're like, These, this is the coverage we've received and the reach and this and that. But then they say, okay, and the bottom line, how does this impact our bottom line? Has it sold the products? Is it moving on the shelf? That's the reality we face in the boardroom or when we are you know having our strategic planning sessions and so while i am totally on board with we need to do the positive thing and use this opportunity to create the positive movements the reality behind the scenes is that we have to answer these tough questions as well so do you maybe have any um input or suggestions for the teams who are listening now to say, okay, well, while we are trying and doing our best to create the positive side of it, what do we, how do we make this balance work for us? I think to, to actually answer that, I think pur um, purposeful brands grow faster. I think that's a fact. And um, we've actually have proof of that is that brands with more purpose or brands with purpose grow faster than brands that do not have um, purpose. So it's important for us to be purposeful, to be positive in the way that we, we communicate. So yes, um, maybe in the short term, it might not look like the bottom line is shifting, but in the long run, purposeful brands do have a, 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 an impact not only to people, but also to the bottom line. Awesome. I like that. I, I really think that's something we can all write down and, um, you know, put in our communication back to the boards and so forth. It's in terms of purposeful brands grow faster. It's a real tweetable. So <laughs> remember to use the hashtag, hashtag G S T Gen next, if you are um, going to quote Spalile for this one. Um, another question for you that we've received, for, um, let me just quickly find a Jade asked, has your research shown that there has been an increase um, self-esteem camera shy or ready confidence issues because of the pandemic? Sorry, Irene, I'm going to ask you to repeat that question. Um, I didn't hear it properly. Okay, so has your research shown that there has been an increase in self-esteem camera shy or ready confidence issues because of the pandemic? So maybe to reframe the question, and I, I hope I'm not doing the, the wrong thing by reframing it um, so that I can understand it. Is she asking that with the, the, the reverse selfie campaign, have we seen a significant growth in, 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 in more people being more confident? I think it's got more to do with the actual pandemic and the COVID-19 um, pandemic ripple effect. Um, have you maybe noticed anything specific in the last year that relates to this campaign? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so earlier on, I had mentioned that we did a research during the pandemic, um, and we realized that in South Africa specifically, 83% um, um, of the 1,000 respondents, 83% of the girls um, or young people that um, partake, partook on the research 
um, they use um, filters um, as well as apps to make themselves more beautiful. And actually, it's because they, they, there is an increase at time on, 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 on our social media. And that's why it and social media shows narrow beauty um, um, stereotypes. And that's why most of the young people, their self-esteem has decreased. So if 83% of the people, young people are using filters and apps to actually make themselves more beautiful, then that is a, a significant kind of like indication that people are less confident because they're comparing themselves to what they see and what they see is perfection, which is unattainable for most people. Um, and, and that's why um, um, I would say that self-esteem um, is in a decline. Right, thank you so much for putting that for us into perspective. Um, I've got a question here from Monica to Paul. Is there specific content marketers should be aware of them from a youth privacy perspective? So there's a fine line in in what you're determining as what your target audience is because their listenerships and, you know, what is the youth and are the youth uh, 13 and under or are they 13 to 18 or 18 and under? Because we all know, and as you mentioned, to have a 13-year-old in the house who's wanting to do everything because they can do everything and they've already realised that they are right and parents are not always right and if they are potentially wrong. So the targeting of what, your messaging into the youth. Is there a guideline? Is there is there anything that um, is determined that set aside that says you're not allowed to do this? There are no definitives. You cannot frame this because you must remember if we're talking Poppy Act, it's talking about how they protect your information. It's not giving you the guideline about how you can, you know, potentially thwart something that's using what you're doing in a detrimental way. So, marketing your product and resonating with an audience has got to be what every, every ad agency, every uh, marketing division, every marketing person, every person who's looking at what they're wanting to message and convey has got to be looking at. How do we frame so that it gets into that space and actually enhances the response that we get in our target audience? Because if our target audience is listening to us and our message is, for want of a better definition, holistic and real, and it's got that deep-seated authenticity. But what often happens is we tend to see that marketeers believe they've got to do the radical. And the radical changes who I am because it flips me upside down. That's not lateral thinking. That's taking me and shaping me into something which you're wanting to force into me. So those guidelines need to be shaped within a company. Um, it's great that Unilever have the view of that purposeful you know, marketing does good in the space of where people are at because purposeful brands have a longevity. They don't just have, you know, they don't just gain market share. They have a longevity. And we all know that when we've seen some of the retailers get themselves into muddy waters by having done something wrong and talking about customer relationships and consumer relationships, when they do something wrong, they're castigated, vilified. People don't go there again. So everyone walks on this thin ice. And in actual fact, it shouldn't be that at all. It's a platform of, you know, shape what you're doing, frame what you're doing, and reach your audience with authenticity. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, there is, there is no, you're not allowed to do this, because we all know what we're not allowed to do, I would hope. Yet, it's um, a very difficult thing, because I call it the digital dilemma, because there are no rules, and uh, in mind. Thank you, Rihanna. So we have to ask ourselves a, a couple of questions in responding to that question. So who is it advantageous to, to the child or to the brand? Um, and, you know, as previous speakers have said, it's, we must consider that every marketing strategy will affect children, even if they are being designed for adults. So software and applications have to be designed with children in mind so do marketing strategies and then we need to understand are they commoditizing children so what are the core principles for unicef is basically yes we do use social media lots and many different platforms to communicate to children and youth on how to access services how to stay protected from covid how to go 
for tracing, how to go for um, COVID testing, education, water sanitation, and so on. We also use social media to hear young people's voices through you report platforms, etc., so that all decisions pertaining to children and youth are bearing the, the voice of children in mind. But what is the most important is two principles. One is the do no harm principle. That is the first point of reflection for any branding wanting to market to children and then ask ourselves, what harm do we cause by running this campaign? And the do not do any harm principle derives from the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So there we came from international legislation, which is very important. And then the last principle is the best interest of the child. So whatever we do, let's make sure that the best interest of the child is upheld at all times and that can children thrive in the space in a safe, in a safe manner. Thank you so much. I like that so much, Micah. Thank you. And I think that's a nice takeaway for us to say, um, do not harm principle and the best interests of the child. And when we market to younger children, look, I always remind people and like to remind us that there are um, age restrictions on the platforms that we are using on the social media platforms. Most of them are 12 plus. So if we're speaking to the younger generation, who's younger than 12, then we are ultimately speaking to their parents. And um, I think if parents can see that this is not going to harm my child and that my child's best interest is at heart, then I think that we will be able to change the perception of the parent as well. So thank you so much for that. Spilile, I would like to ask you next, um, give us the top three optimal, optimal digital marketing channels that are driving converse, conversions without compromising the integrity of the youth. Um, is it conversions or um, conversations? Sorry. <laughs> Conversions. Um, I think no conversations. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about: <laughs> the conversation and the communication. Yes. Right. So um, I look at it at, in, in the perspective of conversations, um, in, in in terms of um, what conversations we should be having with young people, or optimal conversations we we, we should look into. Um, so. From a Unilever perspective, um, the conversations that we have with young people should build trust so that they can have a better um, perception of themselves. Um, the other one is around impacting so that they can realize themselves from a, um, a positive um, body confidence and positive self-esteem. Um, and the other one is about like the conversations that we have with them should build relationships. Um, we shouldn't be having conversations about ourselves only, but we should build really trusted relationships so that young people, children, adolescents, um, parents um, can have um, a safe space for us to have better conversations so that we can have a better impact in their lives. Um, so my, my, my question, I, I had looked at it from a, a conversations rather than conversions, sorry. 100%. And I think what you just said, in terms of building a relationship, is quite a key and I would say challenging thought because if we are doing our market, planning our marketing strategies in a way where we say, I'm not just in this to sell you one car or one product, I'm actually, I want to be on your journey of life because at some stage you're a young adult now and you want the funky car, but then you're going to move into to married life, parenthood, et cetera. So how do we build that relationship and keep that going? And how do we then use these channels responsibly? Um, there we go. I just said for a moment, my internet connection is unstable. So I've got a question here um, that goes to all the panelists. It says, you can't always get everything right. Are there any lessons we can share that we've learned from a marketing strategic perspective. So Zbalile, can we start with you? Are there any lessons that you're willing to share with us? Um, one big lesson for me is to really do your research and understand the target audience you're trying to communicate with. Um, I think for a long time um, as marketeers, um, we just start from our gut feel um, because we are the consumer. But I think it's important for us to make sure that we do research to understand the target audience or the consumer that we want to actually reach out to. 
I think one big thing um, that we've learned in, over the past few years is that we need to make sure that the people that are um, behind and in front of the camera represent our society. So it's important for us to be inclusive, not only um, to um, represent um, the inclusivity and diversity, but it's important to also have the diversity and inclusion behind the camera so that the work that we put out there is really cognizant of how we can communicate better to have positive impact to our society. Um, because I think the narrow kind of like ideals of diversity and inclusion and beauty um, is that if we're not diverse from the start, from the beginning or from the inception, then our work won't um, um, touch or um, have an impact um, to our society in a positive way. So it's two things for myself, research and diversity and inclusion. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Paul, I'm gonna now ask you the same question in terms of the lessons learned. And in that, I wanna mention that um, Safer Internet SA provides so many amazing resources. Um, and I would like to encourage people to go to the website and check it out. Um, so from your point of view and all the amazing, you know, um, my school and projects and companies that you've worked with from an education point of view as well, are there any specific lessons, maybe the top two that can, that comes to mind that you want to share? Yeah, thanks, Rianet. This has been great because we really find ourselves in a, in a world of stepping stones and we're moving from one thing to the other. And for me, the heartbeat has always been the community and the heartbeat has always been that we've been empowered with social, with mobile, with analytics, the like of which no one could ever imagine. And every single family that you're reaching into has got children. And the audience that you're talking to is saying, what am I going to do one day? Where am I going to work one day? And quite candidly, they should be wanting to work with your brand, with your business, to be like you, to aspire to want to be things. And the toughest lessons are that there are so many kids who cannot keep up with their peers and they find themselves drowning in space and then clutching on all the wrong things to believe in. And they think that the world's solution is Google it. And they go there and they find the page one, page two, and they don't get beyond page one and page two. So they are so, they are so um, readily distorted in what they're looking for. And when we built Safer Internet South Africa, it was not done with any commercial aspects. It was done to say schools, parents, educators, teachers, the learners, companies, corporates, everybody, all of us, we need to say, how do we have in South Africa, because we're talking to a South African audience this morning, how do we have in South Africa a safer internet that can enable these younger generation leaders of tomorrow, people we want to stay in this country? We don't want them all saying, I'm getting out of here because I can. We want them to say, how do we have a safer internet world? And how do we make this country thrive? So there are some hard lessons because there's some tragic cases of how the internet has ruined lives. And our, our quest, and I think the quest of everyone who's on this webinar this morning is to say, how do we make it a better South Africa? And how do we, how do we market into it and brand into it and belong to it? Yeah, it takes a deep breath. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we need to take a deep breath often when we talk about these things. And what excites me, though, is even though we're speaking about South Africa, everything we do online is seen by international audiences. So we also have that opportunity to hashtag play our part in you know, changing the perception of international audiences about our beautiful country. And um, I, th I really think while you were talking, a lesson that's, that came up in my mind is that so, so often, and this is maybe a call out to brands, is that so often everyone sits in their boardrooms or in their rooms and they are saying, okay, what can we do? What ideas do we have? Let's brainstorm. In the meantime, there are so many organizations like UNICEF and Safety Internet SA, et cetera, and Safety Net, that we have these campaigns ready to rock and roll, and we want corporates to join. So it's not you don't need to always come up with the ideas. They might exist, and if we take hands, not work in silos, not reinvent the wheel and not waste time, then that could actually add a lot of value. Um, so Michael, maybe you can answer as well in terms of lessons learned from your side. 
Yes, Rayonet, there are many different lessons to be learned, but also building on what the others have said, it's very important to, um, to have positive messages and to uphold the integrity and dignity of children at all times. Um, for us, it's very important that when we ever, you know, take pictures in order to create awareness or to tell a story, which we do, we do need the consent of the child, him or herself, and from the parents involved in order to be able to take that picture, but also to publish it. But then also a, 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 the recognizing the importance of what pictures you want to take and, and, and a story you wish to tell, which has to be positive, inspirational, and demonstrate that change is possible as to create a better future. So this is very important, integrity, dignity, consensus, and creating a positive story for change. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much for sharing. So we need to start wrapping up already. I can't believe an hour has flown by so fast and thank you for the questions. There's one question that I think um, I'm gonna ask and we, we can do a a quick short answer, even though it needs to be delved in deeper at a later stage. How do algorithms on social media drive conformity? And what I have noticed is that people usually check the first few comments to gauge what the prevailing attitude is and will usually just align with the majority. And this was from Putleta, Putlela. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, and in terms of the algorithms, and if we look at more of a technical point of view, you know, at social media and what happens behind the scenes, this is actually so true. And I think I do the same. You read the first couple of comments and then determine whether it's worth your time or not. So from a marketing point of view, um, Spililia, I, I wonder... I've seen an incredible response to your campaign, um, the Dove campaign. And um, I, I saw that it is, it says the Dove self-esteem project has been on a mission to build self-esteem and positive body image since 2004. So would you agree if I may be so bold as to, you know, give the answer to this, that it takes time and you know, repetitive actions to actually get to the space where we use the algorithms in a positive way. I think that's how you, I agree with you. It's definitely how you 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 repeatedly say the same thing so that you your audience can, can understand who you are as a brand and how you're trying to make a positive impact. So you can try and beat algorithm <laughs> by repeating the same message over and over again, but in a way that is actually authentic to, to the audience um, because people actually um, um, engage with content that is speaks to them as people and that's where they actually look further than just the first few comments and, and really dig deep in terms of like what are other people experiencing are they experiencing the same thing as me so very important for us as brands to make sure that we are consistent with our communication um, and we're deliberate about our communication. Fantastic thank you so much. Now, I wanted to give you each 30 seconds to do a final wrap-up sentence, but I only have like 20 seconds to give you each. <laughs> so, Paul, you're up. <laughs> One big lesson, bold trust. That's me, Great. 20 seconds, done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Micah, what's your final takeaway or message? Create a protective and nurturing environment for your child in the home and continue face-to-face -face dialogue and interaction in addition to embracing online opportunities. Thank you so much. Spilele? Um, my thought is that brands, um, behind brands are people and it's our responsible as people to ensure that um, how we communicate to the audience or young people um, or people at large um, does good rather than harm. <laughs> Fantastic. And mine is, I've realized that we all have an opportunity um, to say, what does our campaign do in terms of building self-esteem, encourage responsible digital citizenship and resilience? Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you got lots of tweetables and I hope you made notes and that you can take this back to your teams to create a ripple effect because ultimately you also have the power 
to change the trajectory and for us to keep our young people safe online. Again, thank you for your time. We hope to read more about your thoughts online, hashtag STGenNext. Take good care.